I tell people the answer to everything is whatever he says, do it. It's it's the answer to every solution. To make an assumption to say what you just said. What what is your big assumption you've made about living that way? About yourself, your assumption about yourself. Uh big assumption of me is that I don't have all the answers. And oh! I don't know oh! Whoa! Did you I hear, hear right? that? Somebody out there says they don't have all the answers. Wow. (laughs) Welcome to the Man of Honor podcast, where we help men just like you win the biggest game of all in life, love, and family. Your host, Ed McGlasson, has been coaching and speaking to men for the last 40 years in 14 countries. He's a five-year veteran of the NFL, a pastor, life coach, best-selling author, and has been married for over 40 years, blessed with five adult children, 10 grandkids, with three more on the way. And now, here's Ed. Well, welcome to the Man of Honor podcast. I'm your host, Ed Tame McGlasson. Yes, I'm wearing a giant jersey today. My job was to snap the football to our quarterbacks, whom the last season you probably noticed didn't win very many games. Well, we're not going to go into that. I'm a little bitter, but I did play for the Rams, and I normally wear that jersey to celebrate. And this one is my grieving jersey, where I am, I am, uh, you know, a little bit in mourning because my Giants didn't do so well last year. But today, I got an exciting young squire, a young man who's uh, just full of God's spirit and a, and a message that he's walking out in his life. And I know you're going to enjoy him. And his name is Dustin Barker. And he's uh, newly married to Annalisa. He's an author, preacher, YouTube creator, has even an apparel company. He's doing all kinds of things. And uh, just we want to welcome him to the Man of Honor podcast here today. Welcome, Dustin. Ed, thank you so much. You know, as a Packer fan, the whole Rams thing, I don't really want to talk about it. So. <laughs> Oh man, I, I got a story for you though. If we're gonna talk Packers, I I was on the kickoff team against the Green Bay Packers, and across the, on on the kickoff team, I'm looking. There's a guy my size on the receiving team, and uh, we looked at one another, made eye contact, and it was like I'm hitting you, you're hitting me. We're like two Rams. We run into one another, big collision. I the next thing I remember, I'm sitting on a bench. And a coach comes over and goes, excuse me, son, do you play for the Green Bay Packers? <laughs> I knocked myself off. out, went to the wrong bench across the field. I heard my last name being screened out by the coach, which meant I was in trouble. And they had to stop the game and walk me across the field. <laughs> <laughs> so I had some fond memories there in Green Bay with the Cheeseheads. In that incredible, uh, incredible community, just uh, all about football. But we're not talking about football today. We're talking about the secret that you have learned that whatever God says, do it. So what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I just I just jotted a few notes down before before we started having this conversation. Um, I tell people and it. it It's not meant to be a joke or anything. It's very serious. I tell people the answer to everything is whatever he says, do it. It's it's the answer to every solution. And what it says first and foremost is that God wants to speak to you. He wants to help you. He wants to give you answers. There's a lot of people out there that don't even know if God is listening or does he Mm. want to help. So the first thing is it's whatever he says. So you know he's talking. You know he'll listen. Now it's it's not our job to even figure out the plan. It's just our job to go to the one with the plan, get the plan, and then just simply believe him enough that he wants to help you and and do the plan. (laughs) See that? See you? See because you have to make an assumption to say what you just said. What what is your big assumption you've made about living that way? About yourself? Your assumption about yourself? Uh, big assumption is that I don't have all the answers. And oh, I don't know oh, whoa. Did you I hear, hear right? that? Somebody out there says they don't have all the answers. Wow. <laughs> wow. And he's on social media. Well, see, that's true. And you know, what's so fascinating about this. One of my life verses 
is in kind of the way Jesus lived his life. In John 5, 19, he says, the son of man can do nothing on his own, but yeah. only what he sees his father's son, the son does likewise. For the father himself loves the son and shows him everything he's doing. So in a real way, kind of your life message is the same life message that Jesus had. Yeah. It's, well, it's that whole being connected to the vine. You can't produce any fruit if you're not connected. And I think so many people live, you know, if you look at the story of the prodigal son, so many people, they may be a son, they may even be loved, but they're living outside of father's house and therefore they're, they're missing out. Like, and that's when people understand that's, that's what sin is. Sin is living outside of father's house. Father wants to protect you, wants to help right. you, wants to bless you. But when you go and you try and do it your own way, you're not connected to the vine and you're going to produce no fruit. Yeah. And that, that, uh, I think that parable should, parable should be renamed to the parable of the running father. <laughs> hmm. Right? He runs off the porch. And the problem is there's two sons, neither of which understood the love of the father. Yep. The older son's doing what? He's trying to make it happen. I'm yep. going to earn my way. The younger son blew it all and just figured, there's no way that God can ever use me again. Neither one of them understood who the father was. Mm -hmm. And when the prodigal son comes back, he's turning back. Why? He didn't turn back because he had this great revelation. He turned back because he was eating the food the pigs yep. ate. And he yep. was like, at least my dad's servants get food, so I'm going to go home and work, work off my dad. Yeah, I and mean, he went back. And, and really, they both kind of had a slave mentality, not That's a son right. mentality. The one proved he had a slave mentality in the fact that he went home and he goes, I'm not worthy to be a son. Maybe I can be a slave now. And the other one, the, the one who stayed home, you know, the religious mindset in one, if I slave and do enough, maybe someday father will give me something. That's but what, exactly. I, what, I, what I love about the end of that story, and I share this with people all the time, that parable is a picture of the father. If you don't know the yes. father, that's a picture of the that's father. That's exactly right. The, says, all that I have is yours. Like, you didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to earn it. Like, it's all yours if you'll just hang out with me. That's right. So you, so, so, so guys are listening right now, or maybe some gals too, and what are some of the secrets that you've learned on how you can figure out what God's doing? So how do you see it, hear it, follow it in your own life? So t tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I have, I have so many life verses. Uh, my main one I told you was 1 Corinthians 11, 1, but another one that's just, it's come to my heart uh, as a pastor the last three years. It's come to my heart probably dozens and dozens and dozens of times, Proverbs Proverbs 3, 6. It's, it's one of those scriptures that's often like, oh, yeah, I know it, and it, it can actually become too familiar. So Proverbs 3, so, 3 6, we don't trust the Lord with all your heart, lead not to your own understanding. In all your ways— Acknowledge him. Right. And then what will he do? He'll direct your paths. That's right. How many times do we not acknowledge him? Don't get him involved. You know, we have our part to play. I always like to say we have our part to play. He has his part to play. Our job is to acknowledge him. Then his job is to direct our paths. But he, he's not obligated to direct our paths if we don't get him involved because he's a good God who gives us free will and stands at the door and knocks. He wants to get involved. But just like the parable of the, the son who ran away, he will let you leave. He doesn't want right. you to leave. He wants you to be involved, but he won't force himself on you. So my big thing is just I, I do my best, and I am not perfect at it, trying to get God involved in everything. And I do that simply by just saying I acknowledge you. Like That's right. We get in the car. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge you. Uh, in my marriage, I acknowledge you. And uh, that's been a big thing for me, just trying to acknowledge, just acknowledge him. That's right. And to— you know, and because uh, I have a similar thing that I do in my life is when I when I see somebody, sometimes the Lord will show me somebody, I'll just say, what are you doing with that person? Hmm. And as soon as I ask a question and not make an assumption that I know, as I walk towards them, the Lord begins to reveal. I was uh, in Mexico, and um, I saved some chairs right at the edge of the pool, and I came back, and this this bodybuilder that looked like the Hulk 
went over, took my towel off of the chair so him and his girl, girlfriend could sit there at the, in the pool. We had reserved it. And I saw that. And I'm just going, Lord, what's going on here? Because, you know, I'm a big guy, but I don't have the dudentiness like he did. I mean, this guy was <laughs> ripped. And all my friends are going, what's Ed going to do? So I walked over there and I said, you know, I, those are my towels. You took my chair. And he got a little confronted. He goes, "Well, I'm, I'm well. I'm sorry, but you know, you you weren't here." And I said, "Hey, what do you do for a living?" So now I'm I'm asking the Lord, "What's going on with this guy?" He goes, "Well, I'm a professional wrestler. I I wrestle in the Mexican league." Hmm. I went, "Really? Tell me your name." He told me his name, and I've looked him up, and and so I I looked at him and I said. Um, is that what you want to do with your life? He goes, well, that's what I'm doing now. I said, well, do you know who God made you to be? And it just stumps him. He goes, man, no, I don't. Here's this guy that looks like the Hulk. All my friends are like, what's that doing over there? Well, long story short, he encounters Jesus. I pray for him. He receives Christ in his life. I look at him and go, man, you need to be baptized. I take him into the pool. I baptize him. I bring him out. The Spirit of God falls on him. He starts weeping and hugging me in the pool. And all my friends are like, what are you doing over there? I said, hey, here's a new brother in Christ. And they're mm -hmm. like, you led that guy to Christ? I said, well, yeah, he took my towel, and it was a sign for me that God wanted me to go in and love this guy. Mm -hmm. Because, see, his anointing and his power follows what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. And if we can find out what God is doing, we're going to be successful, you know, in what we're doing. Sometimes we blow it and we try to go over and hammer somebody into Jesus. Well, th th that's just, uh, that's just exhausting. Yep. Yeah. And the other way is just to, it's like this question underneath in my heart was, what are you doing so I can do it with you? Because that's why I love this kind of mission on your life. So you ask him, you acknowledge him, right? We ask questions, God, what are you doing? But how do you prepare your ears every day to be able to know when he's speaking to you? You know, I, uh, I prayed a prayer years ago. And sometimes, you know, people can use the Lord's Prayer as just this religious prayer and Jesus said, you don't want to just babble with no power. So prayer really is a heart thing, not a just a, we read it off the paper thing. Yes. You can, you can have two people pray the same prayer, but it means nothing because one person actually meant it and one person just <laughs> it off the paper. So I prayed a prayer years ago, and I actually just did a YouTube video on this. I prayed a prayer years ago, and I actually prayed every once in a while. And not out of vain repetition, I prayed out of my heart every time, but... Uh, I encourage other people to take it and use it for themselves. And it's been what you're asking. Now, it's been one of those game changers for me that keeps God involved. And here's what I prayed. This was years ago. I said, Lord, I, I really, I want to do your will. Yeah. Like I, I want to follow you speak to me. Well, mm. we know Jesus said in revelation three twenty, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens up, I'll come in and have dinner with them. Well, who's, who's that dependent on? That's dependent on us. We know that Jesus is standing at the door and he wants to come in, so we need to invite him in. So if he comes He's in. He's knocking at the door. Yeah. He's already and there. But who's gonna open that us. door? Yep, it's up to us to open the door. So so what I prayed years ago, the first thing is as three parts. I said, Lord, I want to hear from you. Yes. Like speak to me. I want to do your will. Boom. I just opened the door a little bit. The next thing I said, I said, Lord, if I'm if I'm not hearing, like if I'm missing it, speak louder to me. Get my attention. <laughs> So boom, I just I just cracked the door a little bit more, gave him more permission. And then the third thing I prayed, I said, Lord, if I'm still missing it because I want to follow you and I can get emotional and I can get fear, like I can miss yeah. stuff. I'm still not hearing. Send someone into my life that I trust that will get my attention. And I have a really cool story about that. So about seven years ago, before I met Annalisa, I was getting to know this girl uh, over over the internet online, um, Christian site stuff. I actually met my wife on Instagram funny story. <laughs> um, I could tell that some other time, but I was getting to know this girl and she just kind of ghosted me, just quit talking to me. 
And I was at church and I was a little down and I was working on staff at the time. And my spiritual mom, my mentor walks up to me. No one knew anything, by the way. My spiritual mom walks up to me and I'm a little down, but I wasn't letting people see because I couldn't. I was on staff. My spiritual mom walks up to me and she goes, you know, I've been praying for you that God would get the wrong people out of your life. And I go, okay. <laughs> so, so for me, that's how I kind of keep a balance. I basically just open the door and I say, Lord, I really do want to follow you. I'm, I'm, I know that I don't always hear perfectly. So do this for me, Lord. Speak to me. If I'm speak still not me. hearing, speak out. And if I'm still not hearing, send someone I trust that loves you and has my best interest in mind and have them get my attention if I'm missing it. Because sometimes we can get emotional and we can miss God. Yeah, of course. Or we get so dull. That's, See, that's powerful. Speak to me. Speak to me so I can hear it, Lord. Speak louder. Bring somebody in my life, Lord. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that bring somebody in my life, that's why every person watching needs a local church where you yep. plant your life in around other believers. I mean, it's great doing stuff online and everything else, but life on life, flesh on flesh. I mean, I did that for 35 years as a senior yep. pastor. And th that's just... That's a place where you can go, where there's people that have your back, yep. but you got to give them permission there, don't you? You got to be open to see what I love about what you're doing, uh, young squire, is that you've made a huge assumption, and that is, I really don't have the answers, and so I want it, God. If you don't anoint me and speak to me, I can't do it. And if I'm not hearing you, um, I'm going to open my heart to people that love you who are also going to help me get there, too. Yeah, I have I have a list of people in my life and I don't limit God, but we understand there's people that could direct us the wrong way and hear from the other. Oh, side. yeah. You know, devil uses people, too. Well, so how I do you know that? I mean, if you if you know this book, you'll recognize it when the devil is is trying to you know, yeah. get you to go somewhere else. That's why you got to, you got to have this in you in a place where you do the last thing on your poster there. Yeah. It's not the scripture, you know, that sets you free. It's a scripture that you do. So good. <laughs> right. Yep. And when you're you doing it, what happens? The guy who wrote it, by the way, this is the only book where the author is still alive. <laughs> After thousands of years, the author is still alive, and he and still he speaks to us through it. <laughs> right here on the <laughs> so I have I have a group of people in my life. I have my spiritual mom. Um, she's She was one of my mentors, one of my pastors. She could call me today, and she could call me anything. Like, the Lord knows that's a person. Like, the Lord, just again, I've opened that door. The Lord could call her today, and she hears from God. I know she does pure heart, a person I trust that that has my best interest in mind and loves the Lord. If the Lord needed to get my attention, he would call her. She'd call me. My my most recent senior pastor and his wife, my mom and dad, mm -hmm. I mean, my my sister, my wife, there are people that could, could say, hey. And the thing about the Spirit of God is when it comes, It'll bear witness with me because he's probably already been dealing with me. Of and course, he's already been telling you that, and it's more of a like a confirmation. Yeah, right. And because you know Jesus did the same thing. By the way, he had his inner circle: Peter, James, and John. Yeah, those three guys. You know, those guys, three guys, climbed up the mountain with him one day. Yeah, when God revealed who he was to them, right? So he had those guys. Then he had the disciples, and then he had everybody outside of that, but he needed that. And, you know, I find men in our coaching program, you know, almost every day that don't have somebody in their life. And so well, what would you say to somebody listening right now going, man, I need a group. How do you build a group like that around you that, well, you know, you might not have? I mean, I, I, I literally, I, I've had I had a guy on Monday look at me and say, "You're the first man that's ever loved me enough to speak into my life," and he's like 65 years old. Yeah, he spent a lifetime, which started with a broken dad story, yeah. where he's been isolated. So, what would you what would you say to people about 
you know, how to find a group of of supporters around you. How would how would you say do it? You're get you're getting me fired up because like as a pastor the last three years, one of the hardest things for me was watching people come to the church, and you'll understand this, watching people come to the church and never connect. That's right. Never getting the full benefits of the church, just simply coming in, warming a seat and leaving. And um, I have a few friends, we, we talked about them earlier this week. I have a few friends, I just actually had tacos with them last night. Um, we went out and had tacos, a group of about seven of them that are all- Good tacos, they, they by the way. Good tacos. You want to give a shout out to the taco place? Uh, it's called Manny's. It's in Freeport, Illinois. It was Dollar Tacos on Thursday. So in, in <laughs> Illinois, I love the Mexican people, man. They 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 the, they they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was. I mean, I sat down with these guys, and these were the guys that I really focused on when I got to the church. Like I told you, I have a heart for young dads. I'm not a young dad yet, but God's really put that in my heart. And um, well, you know, because you're young, you have the heart of the father, my brother. Yeah. And when you when you learn to follow him, his 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 promise is to refather us no matter if we had a good dad or not. And when we're fathered by God, it gives us a heart to love people the way he loved us. Yeah. And to see him well, I, differently, right? And to be yeah. able to speak life into them versus just standing around proving that I'm a Christian. Yep. And this is my stance. Well, I'm a Christian. You're not. The, a father goes, well, let me hear your story. Yeah. What's going on, man? Why did you make those choices? How's it going? Are you tired of waking up in a pile of, you know, whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I sat, I guess I sat last night. Um, I had a 22-year-old, uh, 25-year-old. The 22-year-old's like my little brother. 25 year old kind of like my little brother too, but he's one of my friends. He's, he's married about four years. Then we had another, it's so cool how God's brought us these people. I have another gentleman. He just, he had his own business, just sold it for a few hundred thousand dollars. God really blessed him because he learned this principle. God, God, God helped him build. It. He's got three kids. Uh, he's learning to be a tremendous father and, and husband. He did not have a dad in his life. And then you go to the next guy over. He's 39 years old. He's got seven kids. He didn't have a dad in his life, so he's learning how to be a father. You know, got you know got saved several years ago, but you know God set him free from addictions, and he's learned to be. I mean, and the guy's just just emotional mess all the time now because God so captured his heart. And then we moved to the next guy. I think he's 26, recently married. They don't have kids yet. So God put me around these people, and I promise him coming back to how you need a group, you need a tribe. And we sit at the table, and it's not like we do our church stuff over here. And then we go out for tacos and we talk about the bar. And it's like last night we literally just talked about what God's doing in our life. Like we genuinely are enjoying our salvation and enjoying each other's company about mm. following God. And, and I always had this perception, like if you followed God, you'd be miserable. Like it'd be so boring and you just like. Like it wouldn't be I fun. Love, That's what the I world love, says. It's not fun. I'm going to tell you, it is way more fun. I mean, and I experienced this in the National Football League when I was playing because you know, my goal wasn't let's go out and get hammered after the game. My goal was uh, who, who, if my friends are going to invite me to a bar, who can I share Christ with? <laughs> so some of them stopped inviting me because I, I, I'll tell you this story. I haven't told this very often, but I, we were praying for the Giants, and there was a girl that came. She was, uh, her name was Marianne. She was a Playboy bunny. And she was, you know, she was one of those girls the team kind of passed around. And she was in this bar, you know, outside of Giant Stadium. And I walked in and I saw her. And I'd seen her before. And I just, you know how God will show you somebody? And so I just walked up to her and I said, you hungry? She goes, yeah. There's a, bur there's a, there's a diner across the street. Let, let me buy your burger. So we go across the street. And we sit down. I start sharing. How you doing? What's going on? Single mom. She hated the life. And I said, have you ever met Jesus? She just starts weeping. She goes, how do I get him? Mm. She gives her. I, I share scripture with her. She asks Christ in her life. She feels the presence of the Holy Spirit. She starts weeping. 
all of her makeup now is all running on her eyes. She looks like she's got raccoon eyes. And so I said, look, your first step is you got to let those guys know that the bar is not going to be your church anymore. So we walk across the street, arm in arm, and walk in. And I went over and unplugged the jukebox. And they're going, what's up, Eddie Mac? And I said, well, Marianne's got an announcement to make. And they're all standing there with their beers. And she goes, well, because they're looking at her like, what'd you do to her? <laughs> it's like <laughs> her, she, her makeup is all down here, right? And, he, and she goes, you know, I, you know, Ed took me across the street and shared Jesus with me, and I've received him in my life, and I, I felt his forgiveness for the first time, and I'm never coming back to this bar again. Oh, so it was good. dead silence. It was dead silence. These guys were looking at me, they're looking at her, and it was like it was the look that said, "You can't come out with us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't ruin our fun." And Marianne and I became great friends, and got to disciple her, and had this you know many years connection relationship from a moment where God was doing something. You know, you know what that reminds place. me of? Go for it. In the Bible, that story where the women were following Paul and they made money for the, you know, they yeah. made money for their, their, whoever they work for. And one day, one day Paul turns around and casts the devil out of them. And uh, they start following Jesus. And like, then everybody's mad at Paul. Like, yeah. what'd you do? Like, you're upsetting our life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and those gals, by the way, provided money by selling their 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 products to take care of the disciples. <laughs> so I mean, it, you know, part of see, uh, I think people don't understand because this is what I see in you. You understand that you carry something that was given to you by God. You carry His mercy. You carry grace. And the more you receive it and the more power of the Holy Spirit you receive, the more impact that you can have. And at the same time, it's kind of like you're a pass-through. For whatever he says, do it. You're, you know, people get in trouble in the religious world where they think they're the electricity or the power. But you're, you're a conduit. We're conduits, right? We, I, we might hold I, the wire, but he's the yeah. power. <laughs> I can do nothing of myself. Even Jesus said that. That's right. Because the Bible emptied himself and became like other men. I can do nothing of myself. So I understand I'm awesome, but I'm not awesome because of me. I'm awesome because of who's in me. Boom. And you get a revelation, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in the world than he, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the in world. The world. When you get a revelation that God's right on the inside of me, ready to help, I have the answer to every solution on the inside of me, every problem. Like you had the answer to that girl's problem that day. And um, that revelation of that we're, we're always in the Father's presence. We don't have to crawl and beg. We're seated at the King's table. We don't beg for scraps. He wants to use me more That's than I want to be right. used. That's right. He wants, to speak, he wants to speak to me more than I want him to speak. When you When you start getting that revelation of like, he wants to be around me more than I want him around me. He wants to help me more. I remember when I got the revelation that God wanted me to be married more than I want to be married, it set me free. <laughs> I well, he was talk. just obeying a scripture. It's not good for Dustin to be alone. <laughs> well, that, that set me free because I always felt like, you know, see, religion teaches you to beg God and maybe he'll give it to you. Oh, boy. Come on. Preach that, man. But sonship helps you understand that Jesus paid for everything. If you'll just walk with the Father, all that I have is yours. That's exactly and that's that, right. And that's the Matthew 6 principle of seek ye first his kingdom, and everything will be added to you. God doesn't care if you have stuff. He cares if stuff has you. <laughs> and there's so many, so many people are seeking the house. They're seeking the stuff. God will bless you with a good house. He made the earth for you and me. But are you seeking him or are you seeking the house? There we go. And I wanted to add one more thing quick before I pass it over to you because I didn't want to run past this because we didn't ever touch on this. And someone watching maybe like you never answered. Uh, you need friends. You need godly friends. You need right. guys that can speak into your life. You typically will find them at a church. 
Um, and before you go into that church, you pray and you say, God, bring me relationships, bring Here me people go. life with, and he will answer that prayer. I can look back on my life. I had a guy named Jared Larson. He was the man in my twenties that we went disc golfing together. And all we did was talk about Jesus. And then we'd go get ice cream. Like You did that with we a Frisbee? We, yeah, we'd go disc golfing <laughs> and, and we'd go get ice cream. We'd shoot guns. We'd go four wheeling. I mean, we, we did fun stuff. Yeah. Talk about Jesus. That's and right. he's, he's a missionary now in Africa. He's ready to go to Egypt. He's, he's one of my close friends. And then I came here and God surrounded me with a group of guys that uh, obviously in the pastoral role, I mentored them, but they also became people that would respect me as a friend. Yes. Uh, so you need to be at a church. You're not going to find them at a bar. Uh, you're not, you're not going to find, I mean, I guess you could, but you probably don't want to find them there. You need to get plugged in at a local church, people that can speak in your life, iron sharpens iron. So I want to answer that question before we move forward. because No, and, and here's the other thing is that most men that I coach and meet, they really don't believe they have anything to offer mm. with other guys. And so they just figure, well, you know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm nobody. You know, I'm just, you know, I work in security, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of them, you know, started out their story without a dad who was generous towards them. And see, one of the jobs of being a father is that you're you're generous with your children, your time, your energy, your money, your life. And when you have that as a child growing up, you have this anticipation that God's going to be generous with you as part of what's going on in you, and the way your dad helped frame what a father is. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, but compared to God the Father, your dad is higher than most, but not close to him. Right, because mm -hmm. we need to be fathered by God, and yeah. and but when we don't have that, we we have this statement that that comes up in us as men when we don't when we're not fathered and we're not connected, and that's this: if it's going to be, it's up to me. Yep, and it isolates and you, you and pigeonholes you, and boy, what does the enemy offer in those days? He just loves to come over and offer you an addiction cycle. He wants to bring you, well, you're not feeling it. You might as well drink it and feel it or snort it and feel it or shoot it and feel it or just to go have a bunch of hobbies and find it in do, being recreational. And yet there's nobody that really knows you. And when you have that as a man where you got a friend who's got your back, that you can call anytime because and and this is true. If you've pastored more than two weeks, <laughs> you got to have some guys that got your back because being in the ministry. I mean, I was a senior pastor for thirty five years, and I had my friends, and all most of all my closest friends were outside of my team at church. I had a lot of great friends in the church, but those guys that had my back were generally outside of the church. And the reason why is because my board and everybody in the church, they all had hooks in me for certain things. But when I was hurting, I had these guys that said, man, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to pray for you. You know, if, if I could speak to that real quick, um, I was a pastor for about six years and me and my wife just stepped away to do full-time ministry on our own, create videos, write books, travel and speak. Um, and God's been opening doors. We'll probably speak in six States this year. Um, which to some people is small, but we small beginnings, man, oh. we're someday. Small, we mean if you, if small, whatever God see, we're not supposed to worry about the impact. We're just supposed to worry about being faithful to his leading. Yeah, that's good. Right? It's like, you know, meeting a professional wrestler at a pool because he pulls your towel off a bench. Now, that might not seem big other than his muscles to somebody. But that little moment changed his entire story. Yeah. And one day, you know, if I don't see him again on earth, I'm going to arrive in heaven, and I think God's going to give me my dedunta nose back, and I'm going to see him in heaven. He goes, hey, you remember me? That's hey, awesome. I, I'm so grateful that I was such a jerk, and I stole your chair. It changed awesome. my life, right? That's awesome. Right? That, that's the, the impact. 
Yeah. So t- tell me a little bit, you know, as we're kind of winding down our time, but I want to hear a little bit about your new kind of mission and, and, and what God's been saying to you and how we can support you, pray for you, get people to follow you. Yeah, so uh, it kind of led me into what I was saying. I was a pastor for the last six years. last three years was more pastoring. My first role, I was kind of like a college director, but the last three years, I really learned what it meant to pastor. Um, I had no understanding really of it, um, just understanding. And, and I always knew I wasn't a pastor. Like, like I knew I would shepherd, but I'm, I feel like I was more of a traveling, a teacher, and content producer, author. So I believe God put me in the role for a few reasons. But one of the reasons is he, he helped me understand the heart of a pastor. And God really gave me a heart for pastors over the last three years. And my hope is to pastor pastors and be that guy. I know it develops with time, but be that guy, like you said, when they don't have someone to call, they can call me. There we go. And God's been developing that relationship. Uh, I got a guy down in Decatur, Illinois. He was actually a college football player. Um, We've developed a relationship. And uh, uh, obviously it comes with time, but I've told him, I said, I'm in your corner. I'm cheering for you. What can I do for you? How can I be a safe place? I got another guy over near the Quad Cities, which is Iowa, Illinois, that I've been getting to know. So God's been developing these relationships, and I'm doing my best just to be faithful with them, to help them in their call. Um, But as far as my call and what me and my wife are going to do, um, we left a very, very good church, a phenomenal church that we love, with a lot of people we love, with our family we love, stepping out really by faith on this right here. This is what I taught our church for three years. we felt like the Lord told us to leave, even though it was, for me it was very hard because I've lived in this area my entire life and all my family and friends are here. But we felt like the Lord said move. Uh, we've launched our own full-time ministry. So now we are full-time um, creating videos, writing books, and traveling and speaking. And like I said, we'll be in six states this year in our first year. Our online reach through video is already uh, 26 nations. Our first book is in seven nations. Uh, what's, and, that, what's the name of your first book that people can get? Uh, it's called Hello, God Says My Name Is, and it's on Amazon. But it's really, it's a devotional identity. Uh, it's great for new believers. It's honestly, it's good for any, anybody because it helps new believers walk out of that, that beggar uh, slave mentality into sonship. And then it helps believers who, who never were trained in their identity um, because so much of us were taught religion and works as soon as we get saved. Now you got to well, do all let's, this. Well, let's talk a little bit, because this is a, a key point. When p- people say identity, well, I, I know who I am. My name is John. My name is George. I'm a plumber. I'm a, I'm a this. I'm a that. So their their name is kind of couched in what they do, yeah, but not who they are. So yep. talk a little bit about, because for you to be able to teach this, by the way, God had to do this to you. Yep. Dustin, he had to move you from your identity. I mean, I used to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. I used to be a football player. I used to be evangelist. I used to be all this. Now I'm just one thing. I only have one identity. I'm just a a beloved son. Oh, good. Who pastors, who teaches, who coaches, who preaches, who leads people to Christ, who does all church and all city events. Yeah, I do those things as part of the role that God's given me uh, in my life, but that's not my identity. Because if it's identity. my identity and I'm not doing it, then I don't love who I am. But yeah. if my core identity is being a son, which you've said so many times, a, an adopted, beloved son. Yep. Yeah. Well, the identity thing for me, the reason it's such a big deal um, fast tell my story i got born again when i was 10 years old my dad kneeling by my bedside shortly after he got saved um i didn't really give i I mean i got saved but i didn't really start following jesus probably till i was about 20 up until then i was like well i'm a christian i know i'm a christian but there wasn't a lot of like it wasn't fruit wasn't really pursuing it um the lord really got captured my heart around 20 years old Uh, around that time i finished college basketball and that was where I really struggled with my identity because up until that point, I was always Dustin, the basketball player. Like that's who I was. Everyone knew me in the area for that reason only. 
So when I got done with college, it was like, who am I? Like, I'm not a basketball player. I, I'm nobody. And so I started listening to good teachers and really got plugged in and got called into ministry. And God just started dealing with my identity over and over again, who I am. And that who I am in his eyes is not attached to my works. So the reason it's so important to know your identity, let me share quick three stories from the Bible. The first one, Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan came up to her and says, if you do this, again, works. If you do this, you will be like God. That's right. Well, in Genesis 1, it said God made us just like him. She already was just like him. She was, she, we already were, we already were like God. Jesus came to restore us and make us like him. Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of God as dear children. There we're we already like, we aren't him. We're already like him. So Satan comes and challenges her identity and says, if you want to be like God, you have to do this. But she didn't understand. I'm already like God. I ain't got to do nothing. Uh, so she, her identity was challenged. She didn't know who she was. She missed out. She lost the Garden of Eden. The next one was Israel when they came out of Egypt. Deuteronomy 1.8, God said, I've set the land before you. It's yours. Go take it. It's yours. Well, they came in. They said, we're just grasshoppers. We can't take it. Again, identity. That's they right. Couldn't, they couldn't see that they were already overcomers. It was already theirs. They saw grasshoppers. They missed out on the promise land. So Satan always comes to challenge our identity, and I can prove it with one last story. What did he do with Jesus? Right. If you be of God. Yeah, if you are this. the son, right after he was he, baptized, and the said, Father I'm blessed him. And, he, and because he knew his identity, he goes, I'm already a son. I don't have to do anything. So my passion is I want to help believers know who you, like, when you know who you are in God's eyes, like, you don't want to follow the devil because you got nothing. I don't have to earn anything. I, I, you know who you are. I always say this. If you know you're a king, you don't play in the pig pen. <laughs> That's right, man. And if you know you're a son, uh, you don't got to get your identity from what you do, what you have, what you eat, who you know. Yep. Well, it makes you see when you're when you when you're already arrived and you're in the family, you just sit at the table. And your prayer life is, hey, Papa, would you pass the butter? That's so good. And you ain't got to beg. <laughs> Jesus I, even well, said, if your son asks you for a piece of bread, you're not going to give him a rock. So if he asks for a piece of fish, you're not going to give him a snake. If you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will my Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? Now, he doesn't just say give us all things. He says the Holy Spirit because the gift from the Father to us comes by the way of his presence and his power. And when we receive that into our lives, how much more he would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Then that equips you to... Do what you're doing to be a son, to pick up your tent stakes again, grab your new wife without any babies in tow yet, watch out, yeah. and, and, and then go on your adventure that you're going to do and just do what he is asking you to do. And that's, that's enough. That's well, all see. Jesus did, by the way. Yeah. He didn't do anything he wanted to do. He only did what the Father asked him to do. And he started a ministry, got 12 guys, went out and found them. The accountant decides to try to manipulate him, so he lost the accountant, right? Then 500 follow him, and he talks about communion. They think he's talking about drinking blood. 500 people lose, leave in a day. So he grows his ministry from 12 to 11 to 500 back down to 11, and then they roll the dice to get another disciple in there, and at the cross, they all leave. Yeah. And yet, his solitary life where he was able to say, and this is what I want to say when I'm done, it's, it's finished, Lord. I've finished the work you've given me to do. Right, I've done. That's what Jesus said on the cross. It's finished. I've done everything you asked me to do. <laughs> to be able to stand before God and just say, I, "I did it. I did what you asked me to do." Is all that all that matters to me. There and me go. and my wife have been talking. You know, time's running short. Like you just you can see the sign of the times. 
the Bible says no, nobody knows the day or hour, but I think his, we can sense it, it's coming. Like we're going to see Jesus very soon. And I'm just like, Lord, like, I do want to see you and I want you to come but Like, I, I got so much stuff I want to get done for you yet. Like, just, just wait, let me go, you know? So um, when you fall in love with Jesus, like I, like I tell people, like, and I'm learning, my wife knows I'm learning, but I don't obey my wife to make her love me. I obey her because I love her and I have her love. And when you realize like Jesus already loves me, uh, I don't have to earn his love. I obey because I obey because he loves me and I obey because I love him. I don't obey to, to earn his love. I already, I already got that. He gave me that when I received him. That's so powerful young squire that God has given you this so early. Cause I'll tell you one of the byproducts of this, you're going to learn you're because you're being fathered by God. You're going to be a great father to your kids as you are fathering your friends and those people God brings your way. And that's going to be, that's going to be awesome. And then one day you'll, you'll get what I got because you don't, you can't get what I got. I got 10 grandkids <laughs> and they are awesome. Right, and I have five kids that I still have their heart, and then they've married, four are married, and so my family's growing, and my capacity as a father now, grandfather's growing, and it's the call to every man. I think the greatest use of a life for a man is to to be a son who learns to be fathered so that he can father others to be sons and daughters Mm -hmm. and then become a grandfather, a spiritual grandfather who fathers spiritual fathers. That's one of the things God's got on your life where you can speak into these leaders who've never had a guy who didn't have their hands in their pocket. A lot of pastors, there's people with their hands in their pocket. They want, they want to control the purse strings. They want to control everything around their life. And they just don't feel supported. And they need young squires like you, Dustin, who are pursuing them and helping them. So I'll be, I'm going to be praying for incredible open doors uh, for that. It's been an Appreciate- honor to just... Uh, just to meet somebody that God has done so much in, and you're just, how old are you now? 30, just turned 33. You're just a young pup. I got I got a jersey that's older than that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but you've, you've learned so many deep things. And so uh, I know there's people who are going, man, there's just so much in this podcast today. Why don't you kind of close this right now in prayer? Because we could go all day. So yeah. once you close this for those people that are watching, however God leads you, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Heavenly Father, you know we acknowledge you. Anyone that's watching, I just you just we just we acknowledge you. We we acknowledge our need of you. We acknowledge that you have the answers. We acknowledge that you want to help us. We acknowledge that you're good. You have solutions. If there's anyone that's watching that doesn't know Jesus, that's the biggest decision you could make. Like. Jesus died for you. He won't force himself on you. All you have to do is simply say, hey, be a part of my life. And he'll come and he'll come help you Mm. and he'll be you and turn things around. But Lord, that's that's my heart for everyone watching, just that they would simply acknowledge you. We acknowledge you. uh, Ask for your help as a father. Ask for your help as a husband. Ask for your help as a single waiting. Ask for your help as a business owner. Ask for your help as as an employee. We just we need you involved in our life and we ask you to get involved Mm. and Lord, I thank you that that you're a speaking God. John 10, 27 says that my sheep will hear my voice. Mm. So I thank you that even as people acknowledge you right now, they, they, it, it's not hard. It's not vain babbling. It's just I acknowledge you, God. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to begin to speak to people, um, you know, even minister answers to mm. people right now, show people what to do. You're a God of solutions. You're a God of mm. answers. So as your people, as your men or, or your women acknowledge you and open the door, I ask you to speak to them, make it very plain and clear, show them exactly who they are and what they need to do to be at the right place at the right time. And Lord, we thank you. Mm. Thank you for sending your son for us while we didn't deserve it, while we were yet still sinners. Jesus died for us, for the joy set before him, for the joy set Mm. before a family. 
he endured the cross. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Bless you, my friend. Uh, what an incredible time. And I, I want to tell everybody that's watching, get his book, God Says My Name Is, by Dustin Barker. You don't want to get it? Follow him. And if you're in a great place financially, or even not a great place, support him. Find his 501c3 and help him reach the people that he's going to reach. We need these young fathers in this culture to help our young kids be the best fathers they can be. And as a gift for anybody who watches as we do every single show, we want to give you a copy of The Difference the Father Makes digital book. If you just go to thedifferencefathermakes.com, it will be on the screen. You click on it in the bio. You'll get this sent to you instantaneously. It's our gift to you. Well, bless you. And remember, it's never too late for God to turn your story around. God bless you.